That's where I should have. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Uh, this evening's reading is taken from uh, Jonah chapter 2, uh, but we'll be starting from the final verse of uh, Jonah chapter 1. So starting from Jonah chapter 1, verse 17. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, In my distress I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me, and the deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord, my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Nat. And congratulations on finding the page under pressure like that. Uh, let's pray. Oh God, we thank you for your love for Jonah as we were thinking last week. While he'd given up on you, you had not given up on him. Thank you that you've not given up on any one of us and that you are at work drawing us to you and closer to you. We pray that you will speak to us wherever we are in our walk with you tonight and lead us to trust you more. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. At the end of the sermon, we will sing that great hymn, Amazing Grace, written by John Newton, who was captain of a slave trading ship in the Atlantic, got caught up in a violent storm, worried for his life and cried out to God for mercy. And God saved him and it took a little while, but he completely repented of all the slave trading. He gave his life to ministry, became a vicar in the Church of England, which is not always the thing that everybody should do. Just a few of us get called to do that. Uh, most people need to do something out there, but he got called to do that. And he then mentored Wilberforce through the abolition of the slave trade. Uh, and his hymn, Amazing Grace, grace means undeserved love, God's amazing undeserved love for us, he says, that saved a wretch like me, even a, a slave trader that God rescued in a storm. Well, here we have the story of Jonah who got caught up in a storm. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at chapter one. God told Jonah to go to Nineveh, to the east, to this big, dangerous, violent city. And Jonah went west the other way and ran away. Uh, and it didn't go well. God could have given up on him, but he didn't. He sent the storm. Jonah eventually confessed to the sailors that he was running away from the Lord who made heaven and earth, told them to throw him overboard. They tried not to but they did throw him overboard. Uh, and when they did that, the storm stopped and the sailors worshipped. And Jonah obviously thought he was dead. But God provided this enormous fish. Uh, we, we grow up with Jonah and the whale, don't we? Uh, but a whale big enough to swallow him and deposit him back on dry ground later on. Um, I love the way it says in chapter 1, verse 17, the Lord provided a huge fish. In chapter 4, we'll find the Lord provides a plant, and the Lord provides a worm, and the Lord provides a wind. God is at work orchestrating different circumstances. Uh, and even when the circumstances crop up uh, that are not orchestrated by the Lord, he will use all of them to draw us to him. What God is trying to teach Jonah is his extraordinary grace, his amazing grace, uh, we'll get to verse 8 where Jonah talks about his God's love, that is his undeserved love for us. And God really wants to restore the relationship 
that he had with Jonah that was lost when Jonah disobeyed and ran away, as he wants to restore the relationship with each one of us. And for anyone here tonight who's feeling distant from the Lord, God is keen to restore relationship with you. Now, just a word about the fish. I'm not going to preach about the fish for more than one minute, uh, the whale. Um, Some people have a real problem with this. I have no problem with this whatsoever. We believe Jesus rose from the dead and was born from a virgin. In comparison with that, a big fish that's big enough to swallow a person and deposit that on land is not a problem. Uh, Focus on Jesus and the resurrection. All these lesser miracles are much less trouble. Um, It's not really a big feature of the book. You'd think if it was all this sort of great story about the fish and the whale, it would feature a lot. It's just two verses. The Lord provided a fish to eat him. The Lord told in chapter chapter 1, verse 17, and chapter 2, verse 10, at the end of our chapter, the Lord commands the fish to deposit Jonah on, or to vomit Jonah onto dry land. Let's use the biblical words that are being used. That's it with the fish. The big story is about how God uses circumstances that he he orchestrates to draw Jonah back to him. Having said that, if you do go to Google and Google uh, man swallowed by whale, you will find some stories, including one, which I'm not going to read you, from 2021 in Cape Cod, where a diver did get swallowed by a whale and uh, and emerged to tell the story. So um, if you like Google and you like that, it's not the same as this, but it's quite interesting. Here endeth the bit about the fish. The point is that God has used the storm and the fish to bring Jonah back to him. And inside the fish, chapter 2, verse 1, Jonah starts praying again. He's been running from the Lord. He's just ignored him. Presumably the Lord was... He told Jonah to go to Nineveh. Jonah doesn't want to go. Presumably he spoke a few more times and Jonah just ignores, ignores, ignores and runs away until we wind up with the storm. And God will use different things for each of us to draw us to himself. I used to have a a dog, a Labrador called Dudley, who was a stupid dog, but a lovely dog. And we were very, very fond of him. Never really developed any brain cells. But we would take him out. Um, We'd let him off the lead, obviously, whenever we could. But quite often we'd have one of those long leads where you can let him go and then you push the button and say, that's far enough. And I think this is what's happening God's let Jonah go, and then he thinks that's far enough now. It's time, time to reel him back in. And God wants this relationship restored. And he wants Jonah to know that God is a God of grace. Now, Jonah knows this in his head. When we get to chapter 4, we're going to have a break for a few weeks, and then we'll come back at the end of the summer. But in Jonah chapter 4, verse 2, uh, when he's preached in Nineveh, he says... I knew that you were a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. So I didn't want to preach to the Ninevites. He didn't want them saved. He knew in his head that God was a God of grace. But he didn't know it in his heart for him. And God teaches him grace, that though he'd rebelled, God wants him restored. And at the end of chapter 2, when we get, he's sort of learned quite a bit about God's grace for him, but he hasn't yet learnt it for the whole world. And in chapter 4, he's got a whole more lot to learn, which we will come to in due course. Uh, towards the end of his prayer, which reads a bit like one of the Psalms, verse 8 says this, Jonah says this, those who cling to worthless idols, now there's anybody put something more important than God in their life, turn away from God's love for them. He had turned back and he experienced something of God's love for him, though he didn't deserve it. It is amazing grace. Now, a couple of book reviews for you. Tim Keller has written a book called The Prodigal Prophet. Uh, there's, thank you, Joel. Well done for finding the cover there. Uh, that's picking up on the fact that in chapter 1 and 2, Jonah's a bit like the prodigal son who runs away from home and makes a right mess. And then in chapter 3 and 4, he's a bit like the older brother in The Prodigal Son who's very pharisaical and cross that God would have mercy. So he's, Keller picks up on both halves of this excellent Excellent commentary, and one of the ones I really appreciated. Tim Keller reminded me, when I was reading this stuff on this chapter, of a wonderful old book by Jim Packer called Knowing God. This is one of the great Christian classics. Um, my original copy has disintegrated, uh, and this is a new How many people have read Packer's Knowing God? This is absolutely wonderful. It was written 50 years ago, and it was a series of articles the, for, for a Christian magazine that were put into a book. I read it 40 years ago, and it's strong meat, and it's good stuff. 
And uh, in Keller's commentary, he quoted Packer, so I looked him up, talking about how do we understand God's grace for us? And he says there's three truths we need to get hold of if we're going to understand grace. And if we don't understand these three truths, we'll never understand how amazing grace is. So I thought for tonight, that's what we'll focus on. What are the three things that we really need to understand to grasp deeply if we're to know God's grace for us? And they fit very well with Jonah chapter 2. The first thing we need to understand is what Packer called our moral ill desert. In other words, we've messed up morally. We are sinful. We have got things wrong, not just made a little mistake here and there, but we have turned our back on God, we are sinful, and we deserve his judgment. Now, Jonah illustrates that perfectly. Jonah's gone exactly the wrong way from God, and he deserves God's judgment. But all of us have sinned and fall short of God's standards, and we know that. Uh, We know that we don't deserve God's goodness. And that's why grace is undeserved love. If we think we deserve it, we'll constantly be cross that God hasn't made my life more comfortable. But when we know we don't deserve God's goodness, that we've turned our back on him, then when God is good, we really realize how amazing his grace is. Like John Newton, amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. We don't talk enough in our day and age about the seriousness of sin and how it does shut us off from God. Past generations have gone overboard, not talked enough about the love of God. In our generation, we probably talk too much about God's love. Well, you can never talk too much about God's love, but not enough about the fact that we don't deserve it, that we have sinned, that we've fallen short. Now, just to clarify, justice is when we get what we deserve. You do something wrong, you get punished. Mercy is when you get a punishment a bit less than you deserve. Grace is when you get given something good, even when you deserve something bad. Now, we do not deserve good from God. We've turned our back on him. But he gives us good. How good is he, we sang. Uh, The God of the second chance, and the third, and the fourth, and the fifth. And Jonah acknowledges that he is to blame. Last week, chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, we read this. As the storm was brewing, the sea was getting rougher and rougher. The sailors asked him, what should we do to make the sea calm down? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. Or perhaps it was more a bit like Eeyore resigned. Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Become calm. I know it's my fault that the storm has come. He knows he's got it wrong. That's the first thing. Until we acknowledge that we have fallen short of God's standards. We'll never appreciate his amazing grace. Now, the sailors, you remember last week, they didn't want to throw him into the sea. Let's pick it up at verse 13, just to recap. Uh, The men did their best to row back to land, but they could not. The sea grew even wilder than before. So they cried to the Lord, please, Lord, don't let us die for taking this man's life. Don't hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. And at this, the men greatly feared the Lord and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. But Jonah knows he's got it wrong. And Jonah, in today's reading, chapter 2, verse 3, Jonah says, you hurled me into the sea. It wasn't the sailors. He sees it's God's done this. That's the first thing. The second thing that Packer says we need to get our heads round if we're to appreciate grace is what he calls our spiritual impotence, that we are incapable of sorting things out with God ourselves. Now, our society doesn't like this either. It basically says, our society says, you can do anything you want, just try harder and look within yourself and be who you are. Now, when we, it's true that we should become the people God's made us to be, but when we know how far short from God we fall and that we're spiritually dead, we can't make ourselves spiritually alive. We need God to do it. It's why it's grace, we don't deserve it. However good our life is, it's not enough to pay the price for sin. Equally, however bad your life is, there is grace and there's forgiveness. This is where Christianity differs from every other religion. Every other religion essentially says, do this and you'll get it right with God. Jesus says, 
you can't earn it. If you want to earn it, you've got to be perfect, which is a bad way for me and a bad way for all of you I know and pretty much a bad way for all of you I don't know. But there's forgiveness. There's grace because of Jesus. Now, whoever wrote the story, Jonah obviously told the story um, and someone's put it all together. They make a big play in these first two chapters about Jonah going down, Jonah descending. He goes down to Joppa, the port, he goes down onto a ship, he goes down to the bottom of the ship, and then he gets thrown overboard down into the depths of the sea. So it's making a big point about Jonah is just on a downward trajectory until he hits rock bottom, as it were, in the belly of a fish. He knows there is nothing he can do to save himself. He thinks he's dead, then he finds he's not, and he starts praying. And often it's when we're at the end of ourselves and we come back to God that God does his deepest work in us. So for anyone here tonight who's really been struggling, welcome back. The story of the prodigal son is that God welcomes you with open arms. You don't have to sort it all out. You just come to him and then he will work with you to sort it out. And Jonah starts praying. He knows he couldn't save himself. He's very clear about that. It has to be God that does it. Uh, so let's read his, his psalm, as it were, again, uh, his prayer. From inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From deep in the realm of the dead, I called for help and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas and the currents swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I've been banished from your sight. Yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped round my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me in forever. But you, Lord my God, brought my life up from the pit. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Jonah is absolutely not saying he deserves rescue. <laughs> He knows he didn't. He knows he couldn't do anything about it. It had to be God that does it. Uh, and the third truth that we need to grasp if we're to appreciate grace is just how costly God's grace is for him. I remember learning a mnemonic, G-R-A-C-E. It's God's riches at Christ's expense. Now, it can look pretty costly for all that the Lord had to arrange, a wind and a storm and the boat and stuff for Jonah and the fish. But that is nothing to what it cost God to win our salvation for us. We'll remember through bread and wine later on this evening that it cost Jesus his very death for us to be forgiven. And we need to understand just how costly that was. Now, there's a couple of hints in this direction, in, even in Jonah chapter 2. Did you notice in verse 4, Jonah says, I'll look again towards your holy temple. And in verse 7, he says, I'll, um, my prayer rose to your holy temple. The temple in Jerusalem, Jonah knew, was where God's presence dwelt. There was an outward court that anybody could come. There were then the court that was called the Gentiles. There were a place for Jewish men, Jewish women, for the priests to come. And then the holy of holies. There was kind of the the size of this chancel bit of the church, with a whacking great curtain, thick, separating it from God, from everybody else. And God said his presence dwelt there. The Ark of the Covenant was there. Above the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat, a slab of gold, uh, known as the mercy seat or the atonement seat, where once a year the high priest went in with the after elaborate washings and rituals with the blood of animals had been sacrificed to splash it on the mercy seat. God's making the point that sin has to be paid for. It can't just be brushed under the carpet. And there above the mercy seat with the gold cherubim, God said his presence dwelt. And Jonah is directing his prayer that way. He didn't understand what we know, that the mercy seat and the blood of the animals points us to Jesus. We're told by the writer of the Hebrews that the blood of animals can never take away sin. But the blood of Jesus, the Son of God, can. And when Jesus died on the cross, 
and shed his blood for your sin and for mine. We read that the curtain in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom and the way was open to God. And Jonah's just directing his prayer in that direction, not really understanding what we know. The cost to God of paying the price for our forgiveness, for your sin and for mine and the sin of the whole world. And when Jesus died, when he'd finished paying the price for all our sin, he said, it is finished, it is paid, it is done. Now, when we get those three things that... We don't deserve anything from God because we've sinned. That we're not capable of sorting it out with God ourselves and that it costs Jesus his very life. Then we understand grace. We know we don't deserve it. But we are forgiven, we are included in God's family because of what Jesus did. That salvation comes from him. And it's one of the great lines at the end of what Jonah said. Let's read verses 8 and 9 of chapter 2. Have we got chapter 2? Verses 8 and 9. Did I write? I wrote, I've given you the wrong reference, Joel. I'm very sorry. Not Joel's fault. I really want chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. I've just seen in my notes it said chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Can you find that for us? You are brilliant. Uh, can we have a round of applause for our fantastic <laughs> technical operators? Uh, we only ever notice them when something goes wrong, and it's usually my fault, not theirs. Jonah says this. Those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. But I, with shouts of grateful praise, will sacrifice to you what I vowed I will make good. I will say, salvation comes from the Lord. So Jonah has grasped it. Though he rebelled, God has saved him. And he couldn't do it himself. Now, grace is not just for our salvation from sin. It's not just for the start of our relationship with God. We need God's grace for every day, for our daily discipleship of following Jesus, We're all called to serve God, to do ministry for him, and we need God's grace every day for that. Um, And it's the same three things, really. We're saved by grace, but we need to live by grace. Paul put it this way, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1. Since through God's mercy we have this ministry. None of us have ministry because we deserve it. We don't. God could do it all quite happily without us. But he loves to use us. And it's a wonderful thing to be used by God to help others. And God wants that for every one of us. We don't deserve it. Um, We can't do anything spiritually significant in our own strength. We can put the chairs out. We can put the heating on. We can arrange the bread and the wine. We can play music. Well, I can't, but other people can play nice music. But we can't change people's hearts. Only God does that. Governments wish they could do that. They can't do that. They can send the police out. They can put people in prison. They can't change the heart. Only God can do that. And it's by grace that we find God uses us to help others to faith. Wonderful to hear of those teenagers giving their, recommitting their lives to the Lord last night. We can put on a festival, but only God can change the heart. It has to be him. I love this verse from Psalm 127 unless the Lord builds the house the builders labour in vain unless the Lord watches over the city the guards stand watch in vain we can build and we can stand watch but unless God's doing it we don't achieve so much incidentally that verse is on the mace in our town hall in Leamington when Leamington was set up as a town uh, over 150 years ago um, more like 180 years ago, they wrote in Latin, unless the Lord watches over the town, the guards stand watch in vain. There's good stuff, prayerful stuff into our town. You never know it now. It's Leamington, eat, shop, drink. It's all incredibly superficial. But actually the people who set up our town knew this. And uh, this is grace. But so often we try and follow Jesus in our own strength and do ministry in our own strength and we get tired and exhausted and burnt out. So many people try and live the life they're living anyway, which is busy, and then do all the Christian stuff as well and wonder why it's not working. 25 years ago, I went on a brilliant program called Arrow, uh, run by James, who's leading our service tonight. He invited, it was the first year, and he, invited, he wanted a crop of guinea pigs to test out his new program on us. And I was one of the guinea pigs. Uh, in that year, 25 years ago to 24 years ago. I was 36, becoming 37. And I was tired. I'd been ordained 12 years. um, 
And I was working six days a week, morning, afternoon and evening. Took my day off, but I was tired. We had young children. I'd started cutting corners in ministry. I was, I'd got to the point of doing it in my own strength, and that wasn't good. And during that year, uh, God used that program to help just to get back to grace again. It's grace, and I've needed that again and again and again and again. Uh, a guy called Alistair Begg, who's a Christian preacher, says this, Amazing how often God allows his ministers to come to an end of themselves in order that they might begin to be more useful in his service. You can do some stuff for the Lord. It's great. You become a Christian. You start helping. It's wonderful. But there's only so far you can go in your own strength. And if God's going to use you significantly, it has to be in his strength. And you need to know his grace. And that's the story of all the characters in the Bible, whether it's Abraham or Jacob or David or Elijah or Peter. They all foul up like Jonah did. And God's grace is, not, is there that even though you mess up, you can come back, there's forgiveness, there's ministry for you. Now, Jonah had certainly got to the end of his resources, and he cries out to God from the belly of the fish. I wonder if there's anyone here tonight who's kind of reached the end of their resources and thought, well, perhaps I'll give up. Or maybe if I come back, I'm not sure that God will have anything for me because I've messed up. The story of the Bible is that it's almost a qualification for ministry to have messed up and come back and know God's forgiveness and grace. If you haven't, the danger is you become the older brother. You'll find Jonah chapter 3 and 4 a bit like that, the self-righteous one, and I've got it all right and they've messed up, and that's not good either. God welcomes us all back. Uh, I do wonder how much God had been trying to speak to Jonah gently before the big crisis of the storm. We don't hear that. But quite often it takes something quite dramatic to bring us back. And sometimes God uses some horrible situations and we wonder where God is to bring us back. But he does it because of his love for us to bring us back. Um, we're going to sing Amazing Grace in a bit, but I was reminded of another hymn by John Newton when I was reading Packer's Knowing God. This is a hymn or a poem called These Inward Trials. Did you manage to find that, Joel, or is it not there? Joel, is it just amazing? I mean, he deserves several rounds of applause. This is written by John Newton. And uh, this is kind of, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you will identify this, identify with this. I asked the Lord that I might grow in faith and love and every grace, might more of his salvation know and seek more earnestly his face. I hoped, oh, I've, we've, there's a couple of verses you haven't got there, but I'll read it out. I hoped that in some favoured hour, at once he'd answer my request, and by his love's constraining power, subdue my sins and give me rest. Instead of this, he made me feel the hidden evils of my heart, and let the angry powers of hell assault my soul in every part. Yea, more, with his own hand he seemed intent to aggravate my woe, crossed all the fair designs I schemed, blasted my goods, that's a good phrase, and laid me low. Lord, why is this, I trembling cried? Wilt thou pursue this worm to death? Tis in this way, the Lord replied, I answer prayer for grace and faith. These inward trials I employ from self and pride to set thee free and break thy schemes of earthly joy that thou mayst seek thy all in me. It's an extraordinary poem. But we recognize this. We, we say we want to follow Jesus. But then so often we fall short and we drift. And God often uses difficult stuff to actually set us free to follow him. This was difficult stuff for Jonah. Um, I don't particularly want to be in a storm and thrown overboard and swallowed by a whale and then become whale vomit. That's not. But that was what it took for Jonah. If you're going through something difficult, I'm sure the Lord is wanting to use it to bring you closer to him and set you free to become the person he's made you to be, to do the ministry he's got for you to do. I'm going to finish by reading Ephesians 2, the first few verses that speaks about the fact that we deserve nothing from God, 
what God has done by grace and how he's got ministry for us. And we'll finish with this. So this is Paul, and it's a good commentary on Jonah as well. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Jonah was miles away from God, and that's what we all were till Jesus saved us. You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. That's the bad news. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not by works, we can't earn it, so that no one can boast. And then he goes on, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared for us to do. Now, God had a good work for Jonah. He had to go to Nineveh and preach to Nineveh. And we'll see next time that God gives him a second chance to go. Just um, let's pick up the last verse of our chapter and the first couple of verses. The Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I gave to you. And this time, uh, Jonah goes. But that is for a few weeks' time. Would you stand, and we'll pray. And would the band come back, ready to lead us in singing Amazing Grace. Lord, we thank you for these great stories of the saints of old. We can identify so easily with the way they messed up, the way they disobeyed, the way they've gone their own way. And yet we praise you for the truth that you never gave up on them and you drew them back to you. Thank you for the way you drew Jonah back to you. And as we come to communion this evening, thank you for these symbols of bread and wine that show us the lengths you went to to bring us back to you. Just before we sing, we pray, come Holy Spirit and minister to us individually in the quiet what you want to do in us. Just be still for a moment. Maybe listening for what the Lord wants to highlight or maybe questions you want to ask him. Just be still. we were praying before the service someone had a picture of a car going quite quickly but it's going down a cul-de-sac and the only thing for it was to turn around and go the other way and there are some here tonight who are heading the wrong way like Jonah was and you have to turn around and you may just want to say to the Lord in the quietness of your heart Lord I'm sorry thank you that you welcome me back help me to follow your way Or for those of you like me who've tried to do the Christian life in your own strength and you just get tired and exhausted, we're sorry, Lord. Thank you that your grace is there for every day to help us follow you. Fill us afresh with your spirit and give us grace to walk the way of Jesus that is life-giving for us and for others. And all these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together.